So I just want to ask you ladies, how is your focus? What has your attention these days in your life? What kind of pulls your gaze? We live in a very busy, 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 fast-paced time and day and age. There's tons of distractions, just kids, family, right? Like everything can just be so chaotic and pull our focus with a million distractions constantly. There's all sorts of things that distract us just being busy. How, when people ask you, how have you been? I know like my number one answer is like, oh, I'm good, just real busy. That's like my number one answer. And I'm like, is that a good answer? Is that really how my life should be? It's just constantly busy, 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 busy. Constantly. Um, maybe for you, something that distracts you and stills your focus from pouring into others is really we can become lazy. Nobody wants to admit this. Okay, now I went from like, you know, just talking to meddling. But how many times are we so busy, 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 busy that then we need to like retreat and we're like, I'm not moving off the couch for half a day. I'm gonna like grab some junk food and binge watch some TV and nobody interrupt me because I just need to be lazy. So we go from like one high to the other, right? Um, or screens. I think this is one thing that constantly stills our focus because there's so many important things on here. <laughs> How do you feel when I'm talking to you guys like this? Oh yeah, uh-huh. Yeah, that's real good. These are like one of the number one stealers of our focus, whether it's our handheld one, or a tablet, or a computer, or the TV screen, or just out shopping, like everywhere you go, restaurants, when I go to a restaurant with my husband, like for a date night, I have to intentionally sit so my back is to any TV screen because I really am terrible at this. I'll be in a conversation and I like I cannot help it. My eyes just go to whatever. If it's nothing interesting, it's like a golf game, right? And I'm like, yeah, uh -huh. and, and I'm in a completely another another world because it's just completely stolen my attention and my focus and on a date night that's not really where i want to pour it is it but it just happens that quick what else steals our attention and our focus maybe the people all you people in my life all of our kids you know just people people busyness people coming and going and as much as we want to love them and pour into them sometimes they are the distraction you're like what are you doing this is not the plan. I don't need, I can't be interrupted right now. I'm sending a very important text. I'm, I'm watching a very important YouTube short video, and this is way more important than you as my distraction right now. People, go away. I'm zoning out and having my lazy screen time, right? Um, for me, one of the things can be chaos in my mind. Does anybody else struggle with this? Or you have these constant like racing thoughts that never end and there's like no peace in your mind because you're trying to figure out everything that you need to do and your shopping list and oh yeah, on Thursday I have to do that and then oh yeah, I need to run that errand at this time today and the bill is due by this time on Wednesday and we just have this constant chaos of our mind go, go, going in a million different directions and we can't be intentional and focus on what or who is right in front of us because we just have this chaos in our mind. Or could it be that we become focused on what we want? Like, I want this. I want that. Kimberly's going to laugh because we went to a women's conference, not this last weekend, but the weekend before. And I was like kind of arguing with God because I was like, I'm going there to be filled up, not to pour out. So don't even think about using me to pour into anybody else. And I was having like this little selfish, people probably couldn't see it on the outside, but I was having this selfish internal temper tantrum. Like I'm here to connect with you and only you and no people, God. <laughs> at a women's conference 
filled with people <laughs> because I was focused on me. I was like, I'm drained, I'm exhausted, I want what I want, and I want just you, God, which is not a bad thing to want. But I'm like, D you can't use me this whole weekend. No. <laughs> oh, Lord. Come back. Save me from myself. <laughs> um, well, I, I um, did some research um, as I was thinking about, like, God's focus and how intentional he was and his, his conversations and his interactions in the Bible. And I came across this, this thing where they, um, um, they, they looked into the different interactions in Mark, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John in the Gospels. Um, and I thought it was really interesting. Sorry, there's a random hair on here because it's distracting and stealing my focus. Did you see that? But I feel like we can learn so much about Jesus' focus and looking at the different narratives of how he like interacted with people in the Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Um, and, and there's just some things I want to talk about. Like um, he had different conversations in these, these 40 interactions. And, and what can we learn from them? Like, who started the conversations, for instance? In nine cases, only nine of over 40, Jesus initiated the conversation. Only nine. That's interesting. Like with the Samaritan woman, the woman at the well. But in 25 instances, it was another person who initiated the interaction or the conversation. Jesus responded to other people's inquiries. Like... You know, the, the demonic man in Mark 5, the woman with the, the issue of blood, the hemorrhage, hemorrhaging, I can say this word, and, and that's also in Mark 5. There's all these different instances where other people came to him. So intentional focus doesn't just mean that we are choosing to seek out people, but even Jesus turned his focus when others saw him over 25 times of the 40 interactions. And there were either other conversations and interactions that were triggered by like a third party person. We know this. We're out somewhere with a friend and we're like, oh, hey, Susie, this is my friend Sarah. Blah, blah, blah. And there's a third party that kind of brings it together. And that happened many times. Herod introduced by Pilate, Nathaniel invited by Philip, the adulterous woman brought by the scribes. So we see these different kinds of in, um, interactions and conversations and how they started. Also, where did these conversations take place? Where was Jesus in the, when he was living his life here? Where, where did this take place? A lot of them took place in, in the workplace, right? Many took place in homes. We see all the different stories of them in homes. And very few were actually in religious situations and settings. Which I find curious because it's Jesus. He's our Savior. He came. And when we think about like being on mission, being focused, pouring into people, you would just think, okay, Jesus, most of his interactions are going to be in like the temple, in religious settings. But no, they're out in everyday life, in people's homes, in workplaces, um, where he gave them the, their time, his time and his attention. And I found this really interesting. Did you know that um, Jesus asked, asked questions in more than half of the conversations? When he had a, a conversation with someone, he asked them a question. He was intent. He was focused on that person in that moment. So what can we learn from this? Jesus did know how to take the initiative, right? He initiated conversations. He initiated interactions with people, but Jesus, Jesus also responded to others' initiatives. He didn't get frustrated and annoyed and act inconvenienced when someone disrupted his day or his plan or what he was in the middle of doing, right? Jesus left room in his schedule for interruptions by friends and others that were coming for his help. Do you leave room in your schedule for interruptions from others um, or maybe for spontaneous assignments from the Lord in your day? 
Jesus also usually met people on their own turf. How can we shift our focus and intention on others? How many of us have someone in our life that seems like they've gone astray or they're lost and they're out there struggling? And we think, what? We got to get them to church. We got to get them into our home. We got to get them on our ground where it's safe and comfortable so we can have this, you know, time we can pour into them and love on them well. But Jesus didn't do that, He went to them. Is there a way that God wants you to go have an interaction with that person you're concerned about right where they're at, where you can meet them right where they're at? I think of that story, and hopefully I don't botch it because it's been a while since I've read it, where the woman was being stoned to death, right? Or or they were all getting ready to cast all these stones on this adulterous woman, right? And he tells them, you without sin casts the first stone, right? He writes in the sand and says that, and then he ministers to the woman. He met her where she was at. He didn't say, let me clean you up and polish you and take you into the church and put fancy clothes on you and wash you before I can have an interaction with you. She was about to be stoned to death and lose her very life and he met her on her turf. He also met all the others in that situation because he knew what they were thinking, what they were feeling, what their background was. And as he said, you without sin cast the first stone. He was meeting them as well and having an interaction with their hearts. Wow. We can learn so much from Jesus. I just wish we could like dig into all the 40 stories today and like chew on every single one. There's so much richness in, in studying the word and, and how Jesus lived his life. Jesus was also interested, interested in establishing that common ground with others. When you are are in an interaction with a family member, a friend, a stranger, a neighbor, are we looking for the things that divide us? How we're different? Oh, maybe they dress crazy, or maybe they go out to the bars, or maybe they do this or they do that. Are we picking it apart and looking for the differences, for a reason to be divided? Or are we looking for common ground, ways that we can relate to people to really see them for who they are and see their value despite what's going on in their circumstances? Jesus did. I just want to share one of the stories um, of these interactions that we're talking about with Jesus. This is found in Mark 5. It's kind of long, so... Um, Buckle your seatbelt. We're going to read a chunk of scripture here in Mark 5, starting in verse 21. It says, When Jesus had again crossed over by boat to the other side of the lake, a large crowd gathered around him while he was by the lake. Then one of the synagogue leaders named Jairus came, and when he saw Jesus, he fell at his feet. He pleaded earnestly with him, My little daughter is dying Please come and put your hands on her so that she will be healed and live. So Jesus went with him. A large crowd followed and pressed around him. And a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. She had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all she had. Yet instead of getting better, she grew worse. When she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak because she thought, if I just touch his clothes, I will be healed. Immediately, her bleeding stopped and she felt in her body that she was free from her suffering. At once, Jesus realized that power had gone out from him. He turned around in the crowd and said, Who touched my clothes? <laughs> you see the people crowding against you, his disciples answered. And yet you can ask, Who touched me? <laughs> but Jesus kept looking around to see who had done it. 
Then the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell at his feet, trembling with fear, and told him the whole truth. He said to her, Daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. While Jesus was still speaking, some people came from the house of Jarius, the synagogue leader. Your daughter is dead, they said. Why bother the teacher anymore? Overhearing what they said, Jesus told him, Don't be afraid. Just believe. He did not let anyone follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. When they came to the home of the synagogue leader, Jesus saw a commotion. With people crying and wailing loudly, he went in and said to them, Why all this commotion and wailing? The child is not dead but asleep. But they laughed at him. After he put them all out, he took the child's father and mother and the disciples who were with him, and he went in where the child was. He took her by the hand and said to her, whatever that says, Talithia Koam, which means little girl, I say to you, get up. I'm not good at reading that, just so you know. I'm not a good translator. Immediately the girl stood up and began to walk around. She was 12 years old. At this, they were completely astonished. He gave strict orders not to let anyone know about this and told them to give her something to eat. Wow. There's a whole lot packed in to this story, which is really a story of two miracles that happened kind of interlocked with each other. But what can we learn about Jesus and his focus and his attention um, through this story? Really, Jesus was all about his father's business, right? He was on mission. You can see that in this story. And he was in constant connection to him through the Holy Spirit. I bet, I, I just imagine he's being pressed on. He's trying to get through the crowd. He has this, this, this mission he's on to go heal this little girl. And the crowd is pushing in on him. And in his own strength, I bet he was so exhausted. Have any of you ever been there? Especially moms with little ones. You know, you have little kids you're dealing with. You're nursing. You're changing diapers. You might be potty training one. You're like, okay, I got to still get groceries and do the laundry and meet all the needs of, of my household and cook dinner and all the things. And you are just exhausted from all the needs, all the kids wanting something. How many of them, two or three or four at the same time, are asking you for something. And you can get exhausted in your own strength as people just press in on you. But he stayed on mission. We can drown and become overwhelmed if we allow all those needs to just press in on us and weigh us down. Whether it's of our kids, whether it's maybe our heart for people to get saved. I mean, all the different worries and cares of the things going on us. If we take them all in on our own, instead of staying in constant connection to him, it will weigh us down. We have to stay in that place of constant connection to God through the Holy Spirit because that is what needs to be our compass and our guide through everything. Our way out through those four kids that are all asking us something at the same exact time. Only God knows how to get through those moments and, and prioritize what needs to be prioritized, right? Without us sinking into overwhelm and depression. We need discernment and direction from God to know what assignments are from Him in those moments and which ones are going to overwhelm us and drown us. Also, we don't want to do something just because there's a need. How many of us have had a need arise in a friend, a family member, in our church even, and we're like, oh, this is a godly thing, I'm just going to say yes because this just needs to be done. Well, it might not be your mission. And if you're stepping into those shoes of fulfilling those needs, you might actually be robbing someone else of their blessing. If, it's, if that thing is for someone else to step up and be leading down in the kids' ministry or to, to take a hot meal to someone, no matter how little, how big it is, God may have had a different plan for someone else to be able to do that. And we're robbing the blessing from them 
and keeping them from stepping into their calling and, and, and the, the joy that they would get from being the one to serve and step out. How can we stay connected and use the Holy Spirit as our compass? Constant communication. We have to stay in constant communication with God through the Holy Spirit. It's simple. 1 Thessalonians 5.17, never stop praying. This doesn't have to be, I'm going to go in my closet. There is a time for like going in your closet and being alone with the Lord and praying. But I'm talking about your driving to go get your kids to, from school. You're in the grocery store. We're in constant dialogue with the Lord. God, what do you have for me next? What is the mission that you have for me in this moment? Help take away my selfish desires and motives and what I want in this moment, God. But what do you have for me? Right? Because when we got saved, what did we do? We made him our Lord and Savior. Did we really make him our Lord, our Master, the one that sits on the throne of our hearts and our minds? Or do we conveniently shove him off daily, maybe every hour? We're like... I'm going to take over now because I know what's best. Because I know what I want. And you're not giving me what I want in this moment, so I'm just going to do what I want. It's not a good place to be. We're going to feel, fulfill our purpose and be able to have intentional focus where he wants that focus, where it's going to be most powerful and effective when we're in constant communication with the Lord. When Jesus was interrupted by the woman with the issue of blood, he adjusted his focus. He turned his attention and he poured all of his attention out on her in that moment. How many of us get annoyed when we get interrupted? I mean, this is probably the number one thing we get interrupted from that we get annoyed with. And yet, anyone else really, am I only preaching to myself here? I had to tell my son the other day. Okay, there, there's different ways to do this. So it's either putting it down immediately when our child comes, right? Or this is what I'll do. Hey, bud, I'm sending a really important text to someone who's hurting right now. I'm going to finish this and I'll be with you in about a minute because you're really important to me and I want to give you all my attention. Okay, that's me dying to self and not being selfish. Because then there's other times it's like this. What? You can see I'm busy. <laughs> it could be worse than that. Just saying. And it may not be the phone. It may be something else. But <laughs> are we willing to be interrupted and shift our focus? I mean, if, if Jesus hadn't done this, this woman would have stayed suffering in pain and it seems so little and simple with just a conversation with our child our husband coming in the door because what does it look like when our husband comes in the door we're cooking and we're helping a kid with the homework and he comes in and we're like i don't have time for you because i'm blessing you by making dinner yeah 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 uh-huh i'll deal with you i'll talk with you when we sit down for dinner but i'm not gonna give you my attention how simple would it be to shut it off, turn it to low, and be like, oh, I'm so glad you're home. I can't wait to talk about your day tonight at dinner. I love you. And then right back to it. It takes 15 seconds to adjust our focus and pour in because we want our husband, our kid, our neighbor, that stranger we run into at the supermarket them to feel like in this moment you are the most important person in the entire world my eye is on you my love is being poured into you you're an amazing person you're cherished you're chosen you're set apart god has a plan and a mission for you and i'm going to come in with my tender love and my focus and my care and i'm going to support that in any way possible even if it's you just asking me if you can have another capri sun <laughs> right? Mm. 
I know many times I've been busy doing my errands and I see a woman across the store and I go, oh, I don't have time for that. And I go down the aisle and am I the only one that avoids people sometimes? What if the entire reason God has you in that grocery store is for that woman? That woman that maybe drives you nuts and annoys you and you don't want to talk with because it emotionally drains you? Well, guess what? She is drowning and she needs that moment of a hug, of an encouragement, of a smile, of a prayer. Are we too busy to be interrupted? Do we leave room in our schedule for these interruptions? Well, number three, Jesus had deep compassion and empathy. I just think about in this story, his words to the suffering woman. Daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. Does that sound like a dad who's annoyed and bothered that she interrupted the mission that he was on of going to heal someone else? No, it sounds like he's giving her love and care and empathy and tenderness. He's pouring into her. Just like Jarius, Jesus told him when he thought his daughter was dead, don't be afraid, just believe. Don't let fear sink in. How can we shift our interactions with others to be so focused and intentional on showing that kind of compassion and empathy? Because women, we all have a superpower. I don't know if we realize the superpower that we have. We are usually expert communicators. We usually have a higher level of compassion and empathy than men. And we can either make someone feel so important and cherished and loved and seen and valued and heard like they are the most important person in the world in that moment. Or we can do the opposite, right? Cause them to feel like an annoyance or a nuisance, that they're worthless, that you just wish that they wouldn't even come to you or bother you, that they were this small that they're not even worth your time, right? Which are we gonna choose? Moment by moment, day by day. How are you gonna use your superpower? For good or for evil? <laughs> Will you choose to give that person your complete attention and focus and your time and pour your love and your tender concern and care and empathy out on them? Will you choose to speak words of love and truth and breathe life back into them. Matthew 22, starting in verse 37, Jesus says, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment, and the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love. Love God and love each other. This is our call to have love in every single interaction with the others, with our neighbors, whether the neighbor is your husband, your coworker in the cubicle next to you, the one that does the really annoying stuff, that has the black nails and wears Satan horns and spiritually rubs you the wrong way. You might be the only hope for a love interaction in that person's life. You might be the only hope to pour some just hope, love, light into them. You might be the only fragrance of Jesus they're ever going to smell. So are we going to brush off those annoying people, those annoyances, those interruptions? Or are we going to embrace them shift our focus like Jesus does and love well. It's your choice, but I hope you choose to use your superpowers for good.